Yes, please. Hello. It's uh, the question for the second speaker, uh, Dr. Aldin. Javar? Javar, yes. Um, you talked about uh, intranasal litigation of budenicide. Now, there are several, uh, as we know, st uh, intranasal steroids. What's so different, what's so specific about budenicide? Uh, that's the first question. And second is, what is your protocol of intranasal irrigation of bidonicide in, in such cases? Great question. So um, I, I only had 15 minutes, but this morning I gave an a instruction course on it and maybe ex explored that a bit more. Um, Budesonide is, a, is, a, is an asthma medication, and it's actually available in a nasal form, at least in North America. It's called Rhinocort AQ. And, and you get it as a nasal spray. The only difference is the concentration. So Rhinocord AQ is 64 micrograms vers per spray versus uh, budesonide respules, which is used for asthma, where the dosage is much bigger. So we go all the way up to one milligram. So other than that, it's the same molecule. The only difference is the dosage. And, and I mentioned this morning that you know, how budesonide was found it still remains a mystery. No, nobody is been identified as the person who was the first person to put budesonide in, you know, in saline and put it up the nose. I mean, we don't know who started it. I was, it was 2005, and I was at a conference in California, and somebody said that, have you tried this new treatment of putting budesonide in saline? And I went back and tried it, and it worked like magic. Like, it was, it was truly a game changer. And, uh, and when I tried patients with Rhinocort, um, the same, same molecule, except in a much smaller dose, it doesn't work so well. So, so I think, the, I think your, the answer to your question is simply the, the concentration. And, and we're using it, you know, it's not indicated for the sinuses, so we're using it off indication. And I've, I've approached AstraZeneca many times to try and get an indication for sinusitis, and why, why would they do it? We're using it anyway, and to get an indication would cost them millions of dollars, so they'd rather just leave it as it is because we're all using it, because it works so well. So, so that's the answer to your first question. And what is your second question was? How, how do you apply it? What's right, how do you apply it? How so, much? Yes, a good and, question. And sorry, for the first question also, what, why is it different than other um, uh, corticosteroids like fluticasone, for instance, or others? Right, so good question again. Uh, and, and we have trialed all of them, and for some reason this molecule works better than beclomethasone or, or all the other ones that are out there on the market. We've never seen a response compared to this one, as good as this one. How we trial it, so it's always done in a stepwise manner, so initially we'll always start with the lower doses. I always start patients with two nebules in 240 mils of saline. And most of the publications out there from other centers are only with one nebule. And I think one nebule will work fine. I just find that if, if I'm going to give these patients a chance, I can always reduce it. I just want to give them enough to keep, get the inflammation down. The key is getting the inflammation down, right? The problem is not the fungus. The problem is the patient, the inflammation of the patient. So I just want to get that inflammation down. So I want to get them to a high enough dose, get the inflammation down, and then reduce the dosage. So I'll always start them on two nebules per 240 mils. And then if they do great, I can always start reducing that. And if they don't do so great, I keep increasing the concentration. So then I'll put two nebules in 120 mils, and if that doesn't work, sometimes put five nebules in 240 mils, and if that doesn't work, then I'll start using it directly like I showed you. Um, and, and the side effects are minimal. Like we've had patients on it for 10 years now, and we have actually never seen a side effect. The study that I showed you where we found a 6% and a 3% rate of complication was just incidentally. None of these patients had symptoms. We did a cross-sectional study on all our patients. On, we just picked 100 random patients. We've got, I think, 2,000 patients on it now. We picked 100 random patients and just studied them, and we found that there was, there was some absorption, there was some chronic side effects, but none of the patients had any symptoms. And actually, when we discussed this with our endocrinologists uh, regarding the ACTA stimulation test, they didn't want to do anything. They just said, leave it alone. If they're having no symptoms. Why would you touch them, right? Yeah. I would, please. Can I, I, I just um, came 
to get a good answer from this panel. It's quite interesting. I'm coming from Sri Lanka. I'm, only, I'm the only guest from Sri Lanka. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <but> I <laughs> work in an area where uh, there's a, a condition called chronic renal uh, disease, CKD of unknown origin. Uh -huh. Of course, uh, we see quite a lot of patients with uh, diabetes mellitus and CKD got this problem, uh, acute fulminal fungal sinusitis, uh, we call it rhinocerebral mycomycosis, uh, uh, it's mycos. Our sort of result, I mean, result in the sense that they, they just die. So I probably out of 15 patients for the last, uh, say, two or three, three years, we would have been able to save about three patients or four patients. Mm -hmm. Quite disappointing. Mm -hmm. I, I saw your pediatric results are very good, uh, but could you give me some solution, like you know, some sort of dose for amputation? We use uh, liposomal amputation B. Uh, we use, uh, we use, we do quite regular debridement. But I'm just now thinking whether are we overdoing, are we over debriding these patients or, uh, or are we over treating them? Because sometimes they might, they, they die just because of amputation toxicity, I believe. Okay, I actually, yeah, whether children or, or adults, you should first, adults, you're talking about the adults. Actually, the prognosis in the adults are very poor regarding if we compare it to children. Because you have, the major problem is the vessels themselves. The vessels are, are diabetic angiopathy within the vessel. So once you get the ischemia, the blockage of these vessels which are already diseased, you got n n nothing except the necrosis. And you cannot enhance the circulation in this area. It's, it's that's why the prognosis is very bad. So as much as you can, it's the early detections, it's the proper control of diabetes, and the aggressive dosage of amphotericin uh, uh, liposomal type, not the amphotericin B, because the B is going then 10 days maximum, one week, nephrotoxicity, and they are going to die with, from the medications. So it's the liposomal amphotericin B is the one which is preferred. And you can continue for up to even two to weeks to four weeks, and then you shift to the variconazole or the posiconazole according to the pathology itself. So this is the hope. The, the bereavement, if, there is, if it is extensive, yes, you should debride. If it is minimal uh, necrosis, you can leave it and you can shift to the drugs only. So according to the extent of the pathology, if it is m major necrosis, yes, you, you should debride it because it's to toxins. Yeah, I think so. You, actually, we, we didn't need too much to, to repeatedly because once you depreed and go through the, certain, through the medical treatments, it's going to, to be cured, to be controlled. Actually, she's telling us, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> I cannot receive any questions further. It's an order. Thank you. She said, stop. <laughs> Thank you very much.